Two years and two months. Kati and Adolf Rosenfeld had no way of knowing that that was all the time they would have with their youngest child, their tiny little darling, Esther. When she was just a toddler, the Rosenfelds made the agonizing decision to send her to the United Kingdom on a child rescue mission while Nazi-orchestrated persecution of Jews intensified. Esther's parents felt sure that life with strangers would be safer than remaining home with them in Germany. And so for the next eight years in a quiet village in England, the Harrison family opened their home to this little girl. Dot and Harry Harrison became the closest thing Esther had to parents. As we commemorate Adoption Month here in the United States, we are so pleased to welcome Esther Starabin, a Holocaust survivor and museum volunteer, as our guest for today's program. Good morning, Esther. So good to see you. Good morning, and I'm happy to share my story. Of my Thank Holocaust. you. Esther, uh, please introduce us to your family, the Rosenfelds. Who were they? Where did you live? We lived in Adelsheim, which was in Baden. And this is a picture that was taken in 1938. My mother is obvious and my father. My brother Herman, who was four years older, is standing next to me and I'm the cute baby in my mother's lap. And then my older sister Bertel, who was 12 years older than I, my sister Edie, who was 10 and a half years older, and then my dad, and then my sister Ruth, who was seven years older than I. And we lived in Adelsheim, which was a very small place in Baden. My family, my father's family, had been in that area for over 200 years. And my father had been in World War I and had lost a leg in World War I. As a young man, he had trained to be a baker, but he couldn't be a baker on a wooden leg. So he became a person who sold grain and arranged the trade of cows or horses to other people. So your father had uh, been a loyal German citizen, a wounded, disabled veteran, and you are the baby of yeah. five kids. So what work did your father do instead of what he had planned to do as a baker? Well, he sold, as I said, he sold grain to the farmers. And actually, my mother's father had done something similar. So I guess he helped him because the business was actually, I found out, in my mother's name, I have no idea why. As restrictions came in, Esther, onto Jews living in Germany, how did this affect your family in very practical day-to-day -day ways? Well, my father had instituted a law case against one of his clients, and it finally came to a head in 1937, and my father and mother lost their business, so they had no way to support themselves. The other thing that greatly affected my family. My older sisters were no longer allowed to go to public school and Adelsheim was so small, there wasn't a Jewish school. So first they were sent to family that wasn't far away and then they went to family in Aachen, which was a couple of hundred miles away. And they lived with two of my mother's sisters in Aachen. So your parents suddenly have no way to make a living, no way to feed their kids. Um, the family is split up, they're living hundreds of miles away, and this is in a country where you have lived for, you have roots that are 200 years deep, right, on your father's side? Yes, and actually on my mother's side, she came from a place called Rexingen, and there's a Jewish cemetery there, and there are a lot of graves of my mother's family going back a long way, too. And so really, you know, this was home and had been for many, many generations, um, but neither that nor your father's military service could shield your family in November 1938, when the Nazis choreographed a violent attack against Jews all across the Third Reich. Uh, the events of this night in November later become known as the Night of Broken Glass, or Kristallnacht. And these photos show the aftermath in the town of Aachen, the place where your sisters had gone to live in order to attend school. Uh, so really quite devastating, quite frightening. Uh, I want to pause for a moment. Um, to note that we are being joined by people watching from all across the country, Esther. Uh, you should know we want to thank viewers who are joining us from Dartmouth, Massachusetts, Wichita, Kansas, Oxford, Mississippi, and also a warm welcome to our international viewers tuning in from places including Greece, Argentina, Canada, and Belgium. We are so happy to have you with us. Uh, so we were just talking about Kristallnacht, this night of 
uh, horrible violence of mass arrests, and it made news worldwide. In Great Britain, many people were so disturbed by what they saw that some aid organizations asked Parliament to ease immigration restrictions so they could shelter some of these children at risk. And we're seeing here footage. Uh, the British government allowed children under age 17 to enter Great Britain from Germany and its territories on a children's transport known as the Kinder Transport, where about 10,000 refugee children came between 1938 and 1940, most of them Jewish. And among these families, we see parents waving goodbye, uh, were you, tiny toddler Esther, and your three older sisters. And when I look at the faces of these parents waving goodbye to their children, it's uh, unimaginable the position that they and, and your mother and father were in to so desperately want to protect your children that you would send them away to keep you safe. Esther, can you share what, what you know about how your sisters came to precede you on the kinder transport and leave Germany for England? Okay, as I said before, they were in Aachen living with my aunt. So I assume my aunts made the arrangements for them to leave. And they left in March of 1939. And we had an aunt in England who had emigrated there and worked as a maid, because that was one of the things refugees could do. So she knew people. And she found homes for my three sisters. My sister Bertel lived with a family who had a place in Scotland. And she lived with them till she was 16. And then she came back to London to work and live with my aunt Hannah. My sister Edie lived with the family in London, and once the Blitz started, the children in London were sent away to be in a safer place, so she went to live with a Jewish family in the country. She always said they treated her like a servant. And then my sister Ruth originally lived with a doctor and his family in London, and then she also went to the country, and she lived with the family for part of the time, and then she went to a hostel, which was a place for children who had no private home to live. Don't know why she was sent there. She said it was because she didn't do her Jewish lessons. Who knows? We don't really know why. But they were scattered apart and separated. And I, I want to make sure I've got this right. If your sisters, the three of them, were already studying far from home because they were um, forbidden to attend school in your hometown, did they even get to say goodbye to your parents or they just were sent out? No, they didn't. I mean, Aachen was a couple of hundred miles away, and it isn't like today that you could pop in a car and drive there. They didn't get to say goodbye. And um, they didn't tell too many stories. I mean, my sister Bertel said her ears were pierced because there was a old wives' tale that if your ears were pierced, you would never need glasses. And actually, she never did need glasses. And um, they didn't talk much about the trip. Edie, who always liked food, talked about once they left Germany, they were given some food through the windows. But as far as actually talking about their trip or their feelings about leaving without saying goodbye, we never discussed it. It's one of the many things I wish we had talked about when they were alive, but my siblings have all died. Very painful. I'm sure it was painful for them to uh, look back. Uh, we have some very special viewers with us today, Esther. We'd like to say good morning to your daughters, Judy and Deborah, and also to your niece, Tamar. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, you also had a brother, though, Esther, Herman. Did he come on the kinder transport? He didn't. And it's very puzzling because we don't know why he wasn't on the kinder transport with me. By the time the kinder, I went on the kinder transport, he too had been sent away not far away, but a way to go to school. So maybe when the opportunity came for me to go on the kinder transport, he wasn't there and they couldn't get him. Or maybe because he was the only boy and boys are very special, he wasn't sent. But we really don't know why he didn't go on the kinder transport. But either way, your family of seven was completely scattered, um, completely broken, and you were just two years old. Uh, right. any, of, any of us who have lived with a toddler know you can barely leave them alone in a room for a minute, much less send them on an international trip on their own. And in fact, uh, you had a tag attached to your clothing on the journey uh, in case you couldn't tell someone even who you were, or where you were. Let's have a look at this and tell us what we're looking at, please, Esther. Okay, this is tag it has my name, Esther. Sarah was added, the Nazis added Sarah to all the Jewish women, another way of identifying us and separating us 
my name, where I came from, and my birthday, though I don't actually see the day in April written there, though it's pretty um, faded by now, and then my number. And the way that I still have this tag, my foster mother saved it for me. So this was how I was traveling. And obviously somebody had to look out for me because I couldn't take care of myself at two, but I don't know who did. But well, all we do know is that uh, you were accompanied or later arrived in England, at least accompanied by women from the Society of Quakers of the religious group. And for people watching this kind of tag that Esther wore was not unique to Esther. And it may look familiar to those of you who know the children's book Paddington, where it says, please take care of this bear. Um, that that story was actually inspired by children like Esther who came uh, literally with a label saying, please care for me. So let's turn to England and to your second family, Esther. Please share with us how a notice on a shoe factory bulletin board uh, would pave the way for you to find yourself with the Harrisons. Yes, my foster father, Harry Harrison, worked at the shoe factory that was owned by a Jewish man. And there was a sign on the bulletin board, will anyone take these children? And the Harrisons decided they would. They thought, they would like a boy that would be a brother to their son, who at that point was nine years old. So they offered. Now, the Harrisons were very fundamental Christians. They belonged to chapel. I have no idea if they actually knew any Jewish people, but they took me, which was very lucky for me, I think. And Mrs. Eddington, who was the Quaker lady who was making the arrangements for me, wrote them a letter and asked them if they could meet her in Norwich because they lived in Thorpe, which was outside of Norwich. Now it's just really part of Norwich, but then you had to take a bus to get into Norwich or ride your bike or whatever. So Mrs. Eddington um, delivered me to the Harrisons. And the, they were, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say the Harrisons were ready for me. They belong, as I said, they belonged to a chapel and the minister of the chapel had helped them collect what they needed to have a young child come and live with them. And you, of course, as a two-year-old were too young to remember that day, but you made an immediate impression upon arrival on the Harrison's son, Alan, um, who was older than you were. Let's hear from Alan actually in an interview just last year, recalling the moment that uh, you arrived at his home. Esther must have been the very, my, almost the youngest on the ship, I would imagine. But anyhow, sort of tea time, this little girl arrives. She was a bit weepy, I should say. And uh, when she came into the house or into the bungalow, maybe it was because she was used to having a brother, Herman, who was about the same age as me, but she took my hand and kind of wandered around the house, you know. All I really remember about the Mrs. Barclay and Eddington was saying something like, poor little mite. I wonder if I was looking for my family, if I thought they might be there. Yeah. Yeah, that is poor little mite, as he said, the, the two Quaker women, Mrs. Barclay and Mrs. Eddington, who accompanied you. Um, you know, it must have been extremely confusing. Um, we know that shortly after you arrived in England at the Harrison home, you came down with or arrived with scarlet fever and had to be quarantined for weeks. And Mrs. Harrison was able to exchange letters with your mother back in Germany with the help of a young woman who could translate. Uh, she wanted to let her know that you were recovering um, and we have, of course, only one side of that correspondence, the letters that your mother wrote back uh, to Mrs. Harrison. Would you mind, please, reading a translated portion of your mother's reply back to England? Okay. Dear, dear Mrs. Harrison, thank you so much <clears throat> for your kind letter and the postcard of the young lady. Now we are much more reassured as we know that our little Esther is doing well. And we do hope that the fever will be gone completely and our darling will slowly get used to her own new surroundings. 
I can imagine that it is also not easy for you until little Esther is accustomed to you as the little girl was attached to her mother so very much, although she's not spoiled at all. However, the conditions were such that she could almost never go to anyone else. I am so glad that Esther has already gotten used to your son, and with God's help, she will soon become accustomed to you too. It takes a little time until she will get over the homesickness, since even we grown-ups struggle with it a lot, and it is more difficult for the little one, as she cannot understand the language. Be patient, and she will get over it. The most important thing is that she stays healthy, for we are devoted to the sweet child with all our heart, and may God keep her healthy in a faraway country. As difficult as the fate is, we had to part because we wanted the best for our children, and believe so strongly that only the hope of seeing them again makes us strong and helps us overcome everything. Your mother ended the letter expressing her gratitude for the Harrisons and a very heartfelt kiss for our darling. And I have read this letter several times. I have heard you read it several times. It chokes me up every every single occasion. I just cannot imagine. Um, as a mother and a grandmother yourself now, Esther, how do you make sense of the position that your parents were in and what they did? I, I have no idea if I could have done it, but I think even in this letter, my mother talks about her belief in God, and we have a few other letters, and she truly believed in God, and she believed in family, that family took care of each other, and I think maybe that was what happened in Germany, that the family took care. I know I had one cousin whose mother had died, and she went from, lived with different family members, but she just believed in the goodness of people. I mean, not only family, she believed people would take care of us. And I find that belief, considering what was going on for her and, and my father and my brother at the time, to be able to believe that and to have such faith. And then perhaps it helped that she had a sister in England who she thought would be able to look out and make sure we were all right. I'm not sure my Aunt Hannah could really do that, but it was a big responsibility to put on her sister for her to sort of be the person looking out for the four children in England. I, it's such faith. Yeah, faith and also, as you say, uh, trust. Trust in the goodness of complete strangers, people she cannot check out in any way. And you can almost hear her in the letter pleading, you know, be patient, the kid is not spoiled, you know, just hoping that it will be a kind person. And how do you have trust when you're living in a time where people around you are doing such awful things? And that I, it's hard to think about how that could be. Esther, your parents' selflessness has inspired quite a few comments on social media. I'd like to share a few of them with you. A woman named Mary writes, my heart breaks for her parents, not knowing for sure that their children would survive and be treated well, and it breaks for the children who didn't get to know their parents. Um, another viewer named Bernie says, the greatest act of love is putting your child's needs ahead of your own. And finally, Jilly says that the pain of sending your precious child away is the ultimate price of love. Thankfully, another family took her into their hearts. And indeed they did, as your mother had hoped, you did adjust to life with the Harrisons. And you've said to me that it's one of the happiest times of your lives were the years you spent living with them. Share a little bit about the mom in the family who you called Auntie Dot. What was life like with her? What was she like? Auntie Dot, she was a terrific manager. I mean, I've read so many stories about people being hungry during the war. We were never hungry. She was welcoming. My sisters could visit and they became part of the family. She was a welcoming person. Um, I, she, we did things, I, I, mean, I think about it, what did we do? We rode our bikes, we went into Norwich, I guess we had to go into Norwich to shop. We, in the summer, Alan worked on farms and we would, when he was a little old and not when he was nine, and we would drive right out on our bikes and take him um, lunch. And we just did things, and I'm not quite sure 
what else we did, but we I don't remember being bored. I don't remember Auntie Dot. I love to knit and do all kinds of handicrafts that she didn't do. She did do some painting. She was artistic, which I can't do. But she was just a welcoming, loving person who, like my mother, believed in God, believed in the goodness of people. There was a lot of similarity, I think, in, in their basic beliefs. You can see from that photo that we uh, just were looking at, just from your body language, just the, the warmth and, and loving nature and closeness of your connection. Um, what about her husband, Uncle Harry, your foster father? What was he like? Uncle Harry was a very mild man. I mean, he didn't raise his voice. When I first got to Thorpe, I was afraid of him, which I assume had something to do with something that had happened in Ardlesheim with men, or maybe my father yelled, I don't know. But we did things together. He was a great gardener. He also was very good at mending and fixing things. And certainly during the war, you had to make things last so he could do that. And again, he was welcoming. He had a slight stutter, but he didn't stutter when he sang. So going to chapel when you sing, that didn't affect him. He worked in the shoe factory all his life until he retired. And uh, he was just also, they were very warm and welcoming. And they became your parents, right? You, were, you didn't remember life in Germany. No, not at all. And I didn't remember German, the language either. <laughs> Esther, I'd like to welcome some very special viewers, eighth grade art students. I know you yourself were a middle school teacher for many years, so uh, this is a familiar group for you. Eighth grade art students from Central School in Kewanee, Illinois, and their teacher, Mark Nelson. They have sent us several questions for you, including one from a student named Gracie. Gracie asks, do you have a favorite memory with your foster brother, Alan? I do. I, I remember... And I don't know where we did this, but we dug dirt and we somehow made a fire and baked a potato in the ground. I have no idea exactly where we did it, but I remember doing that and being included in things that he did with his friends. And I, I really don't remember exactly when or where, but it was a pretty special time. And Alan was a great big brother. He let me follow him around. He didn't do, you hear these stories about mean big brothers. He wasn't a mean big brother. And he's always been part of my life as he still is. And um, I was very lucky to have such a nice brother in, <clears throat> brother in this family. I mean, the whole family was so special to me. But I went to school in Illinois. I learned to be a teacher in Illinois and my best friend's name was Grace. Where the connection? There you go, coincidence. Um, and as you were saying, Alan was your brother, but your uh, biological sisters were your sisters, but did you remember living with them? What kind of connection did you maintain? Well, <clears throat> they had been sent away to school when I was a year, year and a half old, so I certainly didn't remember them. I mean, one of Burla's favorite stories was the fact that I was born at home and she got woken up and that she had to wash my diapers. Well, I don't know how many of my diapers she had to wash since she went away to school, but I didn't remember actually living with them, but I certainly loved it when they came to visit, which was basically after the war, they would come and visit. Um, one of the special times when Bertel came to visit, my Aunt Hannah was kosher and Bertel found, bought a live chicken in Norwich. I guess Auntie Dot helped her find it and took this live chicken back on the train so that Auntie and Hannah could have it killed kosher. And Hannah did come to visit in Norwich and there was a tension between Auntie Dot and Aunt Hannah. And I don't know if it was just being conscious of me not being brought up as a little Jewish, who knows? Anyhow, this was one of the times that my sister Edie, who's standing behind Alan, and my sister Bertel, who's behind me, came to visit. And we certainly enjoyed having them visit. It was very special. I mean, I guess when they could visit, they came to visit me instead of doing something they might have wanted to do. I mean, not only did my parents make sacrifices, my sisters did to really come and see me and check up on me. So there was a lot of family connections and family care that went on 
as I was growing up. And I'd like to acknowledge another student from Central School, also named Hannah, like your aunt, who had asked about your older sisters and the kind of connection that you maintained. So we can see in these photos um, some of that. But meanwhile, back in Germany, Esther, because of course we've been focused on your life as you were in England, um, as you settled in with the Harrisons, life was growing increasingly perilous for your parents and brother Herman, who were left behind. And in October 1940, they were deported to occupied France to the Gours internment camp. Herman later moved to a home for children, and in 1941, he was very lucky and was able to leave on a different kind of children's transport, this one to the United States, to live with an uncle who had emigrated earlier. Uh, you have clearly become a member of the Harrison family as much as if you were their biological daughter or sister. How did they learn that their time with you was coming to an end? They had always known that I wasn't going to be able to stay there. In fact, Auntie Dot had written to my Uncle Solly, which is where my brother was living, and had asked if I could stay with them, that they would like me to stay. And my uncle had written back and said, no, he thanked them for taking good care of me, but that my parents wanted us all together where my brother was. And my father had four of his siblings were in the United States. I didn't know about this letter, and it was one of the many things that Auntie Dot saved for me. And I also had a picture that Auntie Dot gave me one of the times I visited, a, a traditional visitor to London picture, me with the bee feeder. I had never really looked on the back, but the back of it was saying that we were in London to see if there was going to be passage on a ship. I also had signed a travel document. It wasn't quite a passport, but it was like a passport. Well, I'm not a stupid person, so I must have known I was going to leave because I had signed this thing. But in November of 1947, Bloomsbury House, which was the organization that looked after us refugees in England, had gotten passage one week for my sister Ruth to leave, and then the following week for Bertel and I to leave. Well, the Harrisons didn't have a phone. Nobody had a phone in their house then. Bertel called the police and they came to the Harrisons and said they had to take me to London the very next day because I was leaving. Uncle Harry couldn't take the day off work. Alan was supposed to get a very special award at his school that day, but he got permission to leave. And Auntie Dot and Alan took me to London and handed me over to Burl. So it was a package again. And we went to leave. We were traveling on the Queen Mary, which is a, was a luxury ship, but not then. It had been a troop ship during the war. There was actually a strike for a day. Once somebody from the royal family was leaving on the ship and... Um, in England, it's a great time to have a strike when there's a royal family member involved. Luckily, Bertel's boyfriend was a butcher and he'd given her a salami. My aunt gave her a loaf of bread. The moral is never travel without food, so we were fine. And we left the next day. I was seasick. I didn't want to be there. And I later learned Bertel wasn't anxious to leave, but we had no choice. This is what our parents said. So we went on the Queen Mary and we landed in New York. And we were met by Uncle Sally, the uncle where Herman was living. Bertel knew Uncle Sally because he had lived in Adelsheim before he emigrated to the United States. And an uncle that had married into the family. And we traveled to Washington, DC. Now Bertel, Ruth and I lived with a different uncle on a major street, North Capitol Street in DC. So Herman was living with Uncle Sally. We weren't really together. Did you want to get some water, Esther? I yes, I did. I'm just thinking about how abrupt your departure was from the Harrisons from one day to the next. You've told me that Alan said that the day they sent you off was the worst day of their lives and that after you left, um, his mother's hair turned white. Um, really, even if you know it's coming, it, it, it can never feel good. Um, so you're suddenly, you know, you've moved from this rural English countryside to a city in America. Uh, you're 10 years old. Tell us about life uh, living with your aunt and uncle and that adjustment. Well, it was totally different. Now I was 
really Jewish again, and I knew really nothing about being Jewish. I was living in this big house on North Capitol Street with my aunt and her mother, my uncle, two cousins, and another refugee family. It was three layers. It was really a big house. It was on a very busy street. There was a streetcar that ran up and down. My uncle had a temper. He threw furniture. My aunt was mentally ill at a time before there was medicine for it. So she did things like pulling the sheets off the bed at five in the morning, keeping food till it wasn't good. I mean, as an adult, I look back, I can see how hard life was for her. She worked full time. She was taking care of this house with all these refugees in it. But I didn't see that when I was 10 years old. My one cousin was a big bully and I had never met a bully before. I didn't know what to do. And I wasn't close enough that I knew which of, who to talk to about it. Then I have a lazy eye and somebody decided I was 10 years old. I needed to wear a patch over my eye. Well, I was weird enough. I wasn't wearing a patch to school. So of course I took it off as soon as I left the house and was surprised to find out the school knew I was supposed to wear it. The teacher also, she used to make fun you know, some English expressions are different than American expressions, and she made fun of me. And again, <clears throat> as a kid, I didn't understand it. <clears throat> as an adult, she probably didn't like immigrants. So many levels of shock to go from this happy, loving home uh, that you were used to, um, to this chaotic environment, new culture, new people, not stable. Um, and we don't necessarily feel close to family members just because of a biological connection. Uh, and you were coming from a family where you had belonged. Esther, we have a question from a viewer named Kira. She's asking, how did you discover that your biological parents had been killed during the Holocaust? Well, my, <coughs> I'm sorry. That's my, okay. get, get some more water, get, grab a little bit more water. Um, and I'll tell people that eventually uh, you moved in with your older sisters, Bertel and Edith, who were in their early 20s, and into an apartment. So there are a lot of changes happening. But how did you learn about your parents and what happened to them? I, when I first went to D.C., I thought, oh, maybe they'll show up. But my sisters knew, they had known for a long time, because Bertel had been writing letters to them and sending them money. And when she got the letters back, she knew, and I'm sure all my sisters knew. So I'm not sure if I just figured it out or if somebody sat me down and told me. But since we weren't big about telling each other things, that probably wasn't what happened. So Edie had been in the British Army, and she came over a year later than we did. And once both Bertle and Edith had jobs, they got an apartment, and they took me with them. I was lucky. I would not have liked having to stay with my aunt and uncle. So... Um, yeah, again, this family taking care of family because it was hard for them. They were young people trying to make a life in a new country, but they took me with them. Ruth, in the meantime, had started college. And back then you could work and earn your room and board and tuition, which is what she did. And she got married before she finished college. And you've told me that it was also thanks to the sacrifice and support of your older sisters that you were able to go to college, that they made that possible. Absolutely. Um, one significant change, as you mentioned, in your transition to America was now you were living in a Jewish family as a Jewish girl, which you had not. Um, a viewer named Landon is asking, did your foster family let you know that you were Jewish? Well, Mr. Ramsey, who owned the chapel or ran the chapel, he at one point had tried to teach me Hebrew. I'm mean, very bad at languages. And I guess a little bit about Judaism because Bloomsbury House sort of required that. So I guess they didn't keep it a secret, so they must have let me know. On the other hand, I certainly was involved with the chapel, which had many community activities, much like synagogues, churches, and mosques have now. Community was a big part of it. So I did know I was Jewish, but I didn't really know what it meant. And I'm sure people are curious, Esther, about after you left England, um, the connection you maintained with the Harrisons. I know that you 
did maintain a lifelong bond and returned to visit them a number of times and that Alan has joked that there was a sort of shrine to you in their home. Um, here's a picture of you as a young woman um, back seeing them. The Harrisons took so many photographs when you lived with them that we've been able to share today and they kept almost everything from your time with them. Um, could you share with us a few objects that they saved for you and what they mean? And let's start with this adorable pair of baby shoes. Okay, these are the shoes, the boots that I must have worn when I went to England. Uncle Harry took, repaired them. They're very repaired on the bottom. Of course, during the war, you had to, but Auntie Dot kept them, and I had a pair of slippers that she kept. She also kept the letter back that I read to you, and when I first came to the United States, my sisters were very wise. They made me write to the Harrisons. And just recently, Alan sent me some of the letters that I had written to them. They had kept them. She also kept a doll that had been given to me. And um, we have a photo of you with the doll. Tell us it's my it. doll. It's a beautiful German doll. Auntie Dot and I were walking across the field to go into Norwich one day. And someone she knew saw us and asked who I was. And Auntie Dot, you know, said I was one of the refugee children. And this woman later returned to the Harrison's house and gave me this gorgeous German doll. It is just beautiful. And that, so when I left, I didn't bring any of these things with me, but Auntie Dot gave it to me or Alan brought it when he came to visit. I had it repaired and fixed and now it's at the museum. I didn't let my kids play with it. Of course I played with it, but I wasn't gonna let them play with it and hurt it. But it was a beautiful doll. So I had the shoes, the letters, the letter from my uncle, all these things that Auntie Dot kept. And they had lived in Thorpe when I lived with them. Then they inherited a house in Norwich and moved to Norwich. And then eventually they moved from that house to the house that Alan lives in now. And they kept all these things. And as far as the shrine, in a part of what was like their den, they had this section on the side of their chimney, of the fireplace, which had all these pictures of me, pictures of when I lived there, pictures I had sent them, you know, when I graduated high school, junior high, all those things. There wasn't a single picture of Alan. So Alan was an exchange teacher to the United States at one point. We went to the beach and we had one of those um, pictures taken at a, there and we sent that. So there was a picture of Alan up, but Alan is married now and his wife took down the, all the, the shrine is gone, which it should be, there was no reason for it. But I was such a big part of their life and they were such a big part of my life. And Esther, your daughter Judy has written in to say that growing up, uh, she remembers returning to Norwich often to spend time with Auntie Dot and Uncle Harry and with Alan, and that those were wonderful visits for your family. Um, your relationship and you know deep love with the Harrisons prompted a number of comments that I'd like to share with you, Esther. We heard from Angela, who wrote a tribute to her own grandmother, whom she said also took in several Jewish children. And Angela writes, they lived with her in England for the duration of the war. Sadly, she died of cancer two years later, and all three of them sent flowers every year on her anniversary. Wow. Yes, there were some wonderful people in England. I mean, there were other experiences, but there were so many people who were wonderful. And I, I think living now in this, it's hard to, be, to think about it, that people were willing to open their houses. I mean, it wasn't only the refugees. People, the kids from London were moved out of the city and people took in children there. It, it, it's such a different time, and yet there's still children who need homes. And that, I mean, two of my niece and my nephew have both adopted children. It, you know, it, it just is amazing to me. You know, some things don't change in this world. Yeah, a long legacy. And on the, along those lines, a woman named Catherine has written, being the parent of adopted kids, I know that love can transcend so much. I honor and love my kids' birth parents, even not knowing them. They gave me the greatest gift, and I treasure it. And Esther, you wrote a beautiful piece about all of the different mother figures in your life. Can you please share a little bit about the values that they instilled in you? Well, I started with my mother and saying, 
her belief in God, her belief in family and how important family and how it, family needs to look out for each other and her faith in people. And then I go to Auntie Dot, who clearly believed in God and believed in people and helping people. And then, of course, my sisters who took care of me and taught me some very practical things, how to cook, how to clean, not so well, and how to live and made it possible for me to be a teacher. And again, the importance of family, the importance of helping each other came through all three of these. And even though I say how awful it was living with my aunt and uncle, they loved me. They just, they were having a hard time. They were refugees trying to make a go of it in this country. And I think this installation in me, the importance of community. I mean, I'm very involved in my synagogue and the community, because of the community part, also the religion, but I, I learned so much from my parents and not realizing it until I was old enough to really think about it. And I think it's sad that sometimes these things that are so important in your life, you don't think about when you're young enough to be able to, I certainly couldn't thank my parents because they were dead, but I could have thanked the Harrisons more than I did, though they became part of our lives. Alan was an exchange teacher here one year, and then we brought the Harrisons over for a visit with the family. So that was, you know, very special. But they were such wonderful people. I mean, I feel so blessed and so loved, actually, by all these various parts of my life. And you are very loved, Esther. Over the course of today's program, we heard from more of your family members who were joining us, including Carla, Renee, Aaron and Marshall. So thank you all for being here. Um, and also a viewer named Ilana has said, please write your memoirs. You have a beautiful story and it needs to be preserved. And I know you have done a lot of writing, Esther. Uh, we want to thank you so much for sharing these very, very personal memories with us today. It's very special to be able to talk about it. And, and again, I, I keep harping on today and think about what we can do to help people today. Is there some kid who needs a person, maybe not take them into their home, but somebody who takes them to the park, who knows? There, there are many people who just need someone to notice them and to say more than hello. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Esther. And when I think about your experience in the context of Adoption Month, here in the United States, we are so pleased to be able to honor the sacrifices made by two families to keep you safe and wrap you in your love, uh, really embodied by that uh, repaired and cherished pair of baby shoes, a, a physical, tangible link between two sets of parents that helped to make you the family, sorry, the person that you are today and the family person that you are. I know that thousands of people will learn and be inspired by listening. So thank you, Esther. And also thank you to our viewers for watching today's program and to the generous donors who make it possible. We are very grateful. Wherever you are, take care and be well.